Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. In our path through the Torah, we come to a foundational passage, and yet a very difficult to understand passage. In fact, I think we'll all agree before we start and after we finish that there are things we don't understand. This is in Genesis 22, and I'm going to read the first 19 verses. It's a story almost every one of you here can almost tell me every detail. It's, it's a very well-known story. And it's what the Jews call the Akedah, which is the binding of Isaac. And I'll just read it, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. It certainly has messianic implications. Isaac, for many reasons, looks like Yeshua. Oh, I can see, I have to figure out. I never can tell when that happens, if, where it's coming from. But uh, there's a connection to the firstborn, but we'll read through it, and, and we'll talk a little bit about it. It's one of those things, have you ever noticed that when you study Scripture and you get deeply into it, sometimes you realize you knew a lot less than you thought you did? Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. In Hebrew, what's that? Do you know? Hineni. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, <laughs> excuse me, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. And I just point something out to you. That in our Christian Bibles, it will always say God will provide. The Hebrew does not say that. It says, God will see. It has nothing to do with provide. I don't know how it got in there. It's God will see, which is kind of similar. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And I want you to think of something else while I'm reading this. Have you ever heard of a sacrifice being bound to the altar? Most sacrifices when they're laid on the altar are what? Dead. They're dead. They're not only dead, they're skinned and cut up. Especially a burnt offering. And what kind of an offering was this to be? A burnt offering. In fact, if you go up to the Hebrew where it says offering there is a burnt offering, it doesn't even, in Hebrew, the word is olah. It's just to ascend. It doesn't even call it an offering, even though that's implied. They came to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood, bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am, Hineni. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad, and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. 
as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided, and I would point out to you in Hebrew it does not say that. And if you get a Tanakh, an English translation that's done by a Jew, it will never say the word provide. Yahweh Yireh, which we say Jehovah Jireh, my God will provide all my needs. Yahweh Yireh means vision, to see, which fits kind of here because God can see the ram. God can see. But, you know, it, it shook me up because my whole life, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Yireh means to provide. It doesn't. I thought, well, it's got to have another meaning, just in our English Christian translations. <laughs> Kaya. I understood they do use that as an idiom. In other words, like, it's like, I'll see to it. Yeah. Like, in other words, if you say, I'll see to it, you mean it's going to be done. So yeah, exactly. Now, and, and I think in that sense, but we, we were talking to a fellow from Israel, Gidon, who works very hard in Christian Jewish relationships and, and trying to heal things. A lovely man. He's an Orthodox Jew. And we were talking to him about this passage, and he said, in Hebrew, there is absolutely no way to make this word provide, because it's speaking of seeing, but what you say is absolutely true. In fact, if you're talking to me and I understand, what am I apt to say? I see. I see. And you know very well I don't mean I see. And so it, it is legitimate to realize that this is speaking of God seeing, of, of understanding, all that is true. It's just it doesn't explicitly mean to provide, though that is what happened. In fact, it says here that he offered this offering in place of his son. Go ahead. Well, in Hebrews, when speaking of Abraham, it says that Abraham saw at that time Jesus. Yes, so yes. He saw Jesus being sacrificed. Yeah, and we'll look at that. It, it, the see, I, I think it's important to get the concept of seeing in this because something in this story is not in the immediate story. Something in the story is not in the details, it's in the vision. It's, it's in seeing, beholding. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, and of course here it's all caps, so it's Yahweh, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Be Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. In so many ways, this is a foundational passage in Scripture. Uh, the site where Isaac is offered becomes what? It's the site of the temple. It's where it, this Mount Moriah. Teresa, did you have your hand up? Well, yeah, in reading the details, I don't know that I've ever noticed. Why did the angel say your only son? Because that's not the only son. The well, and you know, I, I did not look at what the Hebrew is here for only. Remember, in English, it, in English, well, it's, it's your, the son of inheritance. It's, it, it isn't the only son. No, that's a good point. In English, if I said it's my only son, what do I mean? I don't have another one. But the word here is, is not, this is, because Abraham ends up with, what, six or seven sons. But uh, this is a very important place. It becomes the site of the temple, and in Deuteronomy 12, and you don't need to turn there, you probably remember, in Deuteronomy 12 we're told that God's going to choose a place. And where do all the ha offerings in Israel have to be made? At that place. Once, once that site is chosen, it's not legitimate to make offerings all through the land. They all have to be made at this place. So. And, 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 and I think you all know today, this is a very contested place. Uh, in fact, when I went to Israel in 87, they allowed you to go into the Dome of the Rock. And in the Dome of the Rock is this huge area where the, the rock is exposed, which is the traditional site of the altar of burnt offering in the temple and the site of the Akedah. That, Isaac being bound on the altar. 
Now, I think you all know this, but I just want to bring this up. Christians have always looked at this story just completely different than Jews because of their view of the Messiah. And I already mentioned to you, Isaac is the firstborn son. Yeshua is the firstborn. I mean, it even says in Hebrews 12, this is the church or the assembly of the firstborn. But you may have thought of these, but I like the way they put this all together. Isaac and Yeshua were both miraculous births. Yeshua had no earthly father. And when Isaac was born, his mother was 90, well past childbearing age. And she and Abraham had been married 70 years. And so both of them were children of miracles. Isaac was his father's beloved son, and we actually hear the voice from heaven when Yeshua is baptized by John. Do you remember? This is my son whom I love. So we have that parallel. Did you pick up who carried the wood for the sacrifice? Isaac did. What did Yeshua do? He carried his cross. How long was the journey to Moriah? Three days. On the third day, Yeshua... I mean, the, the parallels are incredible. The, the, the difference is that Yeshua ends up actually giving his life, and Isaac is spared. And of course, all this is very much a messianic Christian perspective. Uh, people do not know what to do with this story because it has... I hope you picked up, there are some real problems with this story. In scripture, in general, what's God's view of sacrificing your children? It's an abomination. He says, in, in one place, I wonder if I put it here. I might not have. But it actually says in scripture to make sure that you bring punishment to those parents who offer their children to Moloch. Don't ever offer your children. And how many, I don't know how God spoke to Abraham, but I've thought of this a lot. I'm sure you all have, really. This is one I couldn't do. I could not do it. it I mean, every time I read the story, it just, I, I just, I cannot figure it out. Uh, and like I asked you earlier on, why was he bound on the altar? Well, you have to realize this kid is probably at the least 18, maybe 37. How's he going to make it? I mean, yeah, I mean, this guy is 100 and... Abraham is at least 120. Yeah, no, I, the story is... yeah. I, if there's any offering I know of that needs to be tied to the altar, it's me. <laughs> I know how to wiggle off. It's like Bob Mumford said, the problem with the living sacrifice is it can get off the altar. <laughs> But seriously, when you think about this, and another uh, thing that the Jewish sages, th this story drives the Jewish sages crazy. If you go in and look at Jewish rabbinical commentary, there is not a consistent, this is what it means. They, and, and they're very bothered by just before this, when God comes to Abraham and he says, I'm going to judge Sodom and I'm going to destroy the city. What does Abraham do? He pleads for the life of these wicked people. He starts with 50. If they're 50 righteous, will you save the whole city? Goes down to 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. When God asks him to sacrifice his son, what does Abraham do? Gets up in the morning, gets on his donkey, and goes to Mount Moriah. The whole thing is, it's odd. And yet I think there's a great difference because in one case, Abraham is pleading for other people. In this case, it's something that God's asking from him. And, you know, I, I think I, you're, you're both aware, I mean, you're all aware, I think, that there are two scriptures in the New Testament, in the Brit Hadashah, about this incident. And uh, I'll read them. One's in Hebrews 11, and one's in James 2. Hebrews 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. 
And you notice how this started. How, how does this whole story start? God tested Abraham. There, there was an evaluation, something. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. That's how it puts it in the, uh, I think this is the New American Standard. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendant shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So the writer of Hebrews sees this, that Abraham believed that he could be resurrected. James, now, now the writer of Hebrews is saying that this was an act of faith. Everyone agree? That's what, how does James use the story? <laughs> if you haven't picked this up before, Scripture does not disagree with itself, but it's intention. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Who said that? Has to be James. That's the head of the church. That's the brother of Yeshua. His name was actually Jacob. So he says, faith without works is useless. Was not our father, Abraham our father, justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? So the writer of Hebrews is using this as a picture of Abraham's faith. And Jacob, James, the brother of Yeshua, is saying it's an example of faith that works. They're not in disagreement. He was justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Had you picked up before that this story of the binding of Isaac is used as a picture of faith in Hebrews and works? In James, and they're both right. I mean, Abraham obviously believed. Teresa. Well, it is a huge contrast, you know, with how the story of Abraham kind of starts, where God says, I'm your greater reward, and you know, I don't have a son. To this. Yes. I mean, something no, that's matured, or whatever you mean. It's a very good point, Teresa. That's something I will talk about, because I think you probably all remember what Teresa just said. Genesis 15, God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I am your shield, I'm your great reward. Remember what Abraham's response was? What can you do for me? I don't have an heir. So what was the most important thing in Abraham's life totally? It was that heir. That was more important than God. Carrie, I saw your hand. So isn't it kind of, uh, he did, Vice versa. So God said, well, later on, you can test me. And then uh, Isaac or Abraham was tested by God. But then he tested God later, didn't he? And that, I mean, you can test me and do and ask for, where is it? Is it later on where he. There are definitely passages that, where God says, you can test me. So he was testing God and then he tested God. Or God, God tested him and then he tested God. Well, there, there is, and it's interesting because when Satan tempted Yeshua, do you remember what Yeshua told him? Because he, he said, cast yourself, anybody here, been, if you've been to Jerusalem and you've seen the Western Wall, taking somebody up there and saying, cast yourself down, <laughs> and it's not nearly as high now as it was then. And Yeshua's response was what? You shall not test the Lord your God, tempt him. And so there's this concept of, and then Malachi 3 says, you haven't brought the tithes and the full offerings into the house. What's the next word? Test me in this. Can you save, or I'm going to destroy the city. Well, can you save 50? Uh, okay, well, can you save 10? So he's sitting there bartering and testing God, wasn't he? He was. He, he was certainly, and, and I'll, what, we can talk a little bit about that. There's this picture of a test that reveals. In fact, we have a bunch of teachers in the class. Why do you give tests? There, a lot of people will criticize tests and say they're not good. I have never seen anything. I mean, tests are terrible, I agree. 
but I've never seen anything that's as good at ascertaining what the child has learned. I mean, some kids don't do well in tests. That story that, uh, that not Greg told, but that the, was up there really impacted me. I've seen this over and over, that the expectation of the parent or the teacher comes out in the child's performance. So the tests have their flaws, but a test reveals what is. You know, it's like people that pray to do well on a test and didn't prepare for it. And you're like, <laughs> another one of Bob Mumford's famous statements, you sow wild oats and pray for crop failure. Did you have your head up? Uh, I don't mean to distract you, but I, I just have this question. Way back uh, when you were talking about the dome of the rock and going in and that there was a rock. So if that's the place that supposedly was the offering place of Isaac, then why is it sacred to the Muslims? Is there, Isaac is not there. Well, it, you know, it, here, it, that's a long, Lois asks, why is this sacred to the Muslims? Number one, why would they build the dome there? My opinion, they built it because they wanted to thumb their nose at the Jews. Number two, this is the place of the ascension of Muhammad. This is Muhammad ascends into the heavens. So they, and they that's become... The rock is the place he ascended, not the rock that where... But, but you have to realize, at least to some Muslims, Isaac is not the offering. Ishmael is. Go ahead, Kaya. I was going to say, allegorically, I found this interesting because I'd never noticed it until I read some commentary on it. But if you actually just read, it says Abraham and Isaac went up the mountain when they were getting ready to make It only ever says that Abraham came back. And Isaac, the name Isaac is not mentioned again until a bride is brought to him. And just allegorically speaking, as him representing Jesus, that's interesting. I mean, it alludes that Isaac came down, but it never says it. It just says that Abraham came down from the mountain. In other words, it's a very great picture of Yeshua ascending and then coming back for his bride. No, I mean, the, the story of Isaac parallels Yeshua so exactly it's not accidental. It's obviously a, it's in the scripture. I, you know, I understand why the Jews don't believe it, because they don't see him as this Messiah yet. But let's talk a little bit about this concept of testing, uh, like what Kerry mentioned. And when you look at testing, testing does a lot of things, but it reveals, I mean, it's like when I was in school, and when you were in school, they'd have a chemistry exam, and, and to a student, it seems like it's just to inflict pain. That's what you, you have no idea why they're having a test. <laughs> but really, it's the way the teacher finds out, are you picking up the material? And what's more, it's like when you become a veterinarian, and many other occupations are this way, I can't practice in your state until I take an exam. I did, I did this in both Nevada and Utah, and it's a good thing I did, because it would be bad if I had to go take that test now. It was a long time ago, but the test reveals, have I mastered the material? It's not perfect, but it's a whole lot better than just saying anyone can do it. And uh, so a, a test is very important, and it's interesting that it starts off with saying God tested Abraham, and I think you need to look at what Teresa brought up. When God first comes to Abram and says, I'm your reward, his response is, what can you give me? Because I need an heir, and without an heir, I'm nobody. And God is patient with him. He says, you're going to have an heir, and from that heir, you'll have, he'll have descendants that will be like the stars in the sky, the sand on the seashore, the dust of... He, he, I'm always amazed at how gentle and kind God is to Abram. But in a certain sense, this is a test to see if Abram has figured out who's important. Another thing, and this is what Rabbi Sachs said, and I, I fully endorse this, the story is also telling us that children do not belong to the parents. They belong to God. You do not own your children. And see, ancient societies, you did own your children. People could get away with doing things to their kids because the kids were looked at as almost like slaves. And the Bible has this consistent theme that a child is made in the image of God and the parent is a caretaker, but they don't own the children. Gerald, I think you had your hand up. Well, I was thinking about this concept of testing because depending on your experience, you know, tests are things you sit down, you write down answers, hopefully you know some of them, but maybe not. But there's this faith and works part of it. There's a knowledge part. And this is what I see Abraham is going through. God made him this promise. 
But then we have this tendency to say, well, show me the money. You know, where's the reality of this? And this is part of the test. And I don't think he was bartering in so much as he was trying to understand how God did things when he said, I'm going to destroy the city. And, he's, and so he's trying to understand how God understands things so that he can know God better. And, and part of the test is, I mean, there's knowledge, but then there's proficiency and ability. And I don't remember the reference, but in Deuteronomy, he tells the people, you know, as they're about to go into the line, I tested you all this time in the wilderness to see if you would accept my word and become the people that you need to be to continue on. And so it's like love. In our language, test is, is too limiting a word. I mean, it has too many connotations. And so uh, you really do need to be specific because God does say, don't test me or test me. <laughs> and we need, like Abraham, I think, to understand how God works better. Yeah, I looked up the word test in Hebrew. The word that's used here is nasah. If you know Hebrew, it's just a simple noon, a samach, and a hey. Just nasa, N-S-A. That's interesting. Uh, but in uh, any case, and, and as you mentioned, the test, God's constantly testing us. We're constantly testing Him, and yet in a certain sense, we're called not to tempt the Lord. But when you look at the story, test is used here to say, to reveal. And you know who, is, who needed to know this more than anyone? Abraham. God knew. Abraham didn't. And, and the, the story, I, I don't think you, I know I'll never totally understand it because, like I said, I think I have three sons. I, there was no way on earth I could sacrifice my, nope. I, and so, when I look at this story, it, it kind of blows all my circuits. And, and it also does something else to me, if you stop and think about it. And there's no way we can fully comprehend this, but do you have any concept of what the father went through when his son died on the cross? I don't, I don't, I mean, you can come close if you've got kids and you imagine tying your child up to sacrifice them. There's just something wrong with this story. And uh, yeah, it's, it's here. That's what I love about the Bible. It has stuff that drives me crazy. But the fact it's not been sanitized to make it palatable makes it so I can believe it. It's the real thing. Kai had his hand up then Carrie. I don't know if this is what Carrie meant, but in a certain sense, God testing Abraham was also Abraham testing God because he's, he's saying, okay, you promised me this son. So if I, if I thought I, of that too. I'm, I'm testing to see how faithful you are to continue your, your faithfulness to me in saying you, you promised me this son. Yeah, it, it shows the complete faith of Abraham, doesn't it? Because he's willing. I mean, I get a sense in this that Abraham is so. He's, it's one of those times where he knows God has spoken, and so he's just going to go ahead and do it. He doesn't understand, I don't think. Uh, but, but it is definitely a test of God. And what the writer of Hebrews says is that whatever happened, Abraham still believed Isaac would be his heir. Go ahead, Kerry. Yeah, that's basically what I was trying to say is, you know, I'll test you, you test me sort of thing. But this is kind of a weird question, and you probably can't answer it. But it's just always, a, I've wondered about it. Do you think God would have saved those people if Abraham not tested him and asked him? And I know it's, you can't answer the question, but it's always interesting. Well, you know, it, it is an interesting question to me. Uh, we, you, know, you mentioned, would God have saved Lot and his family if Abraham hadn't tested him? The, the interesting thing there is that we don't know, but all through Scripture we constantly find that what God does is changed by people. He wants us to ask Him. He wants us to listen to Him. He doesn't even mind arguing with Him if we're listening to Him. You know, the thing God can't stand is being ignored. Lois, you had your hand up. Well, I mean, in response to Carrie, I mean, the story of Jonah is pretty good for that one. It is. Because God did change. I mean, 
when he changed people, his sentence. When the, when the people of Nineveh repented, he changed the sentence, made Jonah mad. See, this is one of the things that Jews are a little different from Christians. They believe that there can be prophecies that if the people repent, the prophecy does not come to pass. So they said there could be this prophecy of great destruction, but if the people repent, God is a God of, re of forgiveness. Go ahead, Kaya. Yeah, I was going to say what comes to my mind is, is the prophets uh, where they say God's saying, I was just looking for someone to stand in the gap. If he would have had someone to stand in the gap, he could have... I would have spared the land. To repentance or people to repentance and spared it. But, so I think, I think, I mean, I don't know about him saving Lot because it says Lot was a righteous man. But, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. About that. <laughs> in my mind, Lot's horrible, but that's just, you know, <laughs> Peter liked him. To me. <laughs> well, you know, the interesting thing, we, we talk about Lot, and obviously God considered him righteous. But the angels literally had to kick Lot out of the city. He would not leave. And it, I mean, it, it, the pull is so strong that, you know, we have the picture of his wife looking back. Just, I'll mention a, uh, a few things where this same word, nasa is used to test. And these will all be things that you're familiar with. This story where God says, I tested Abraham. Abraham. It's Abraham here. But then in Judges, where the Lord said, I've left these people in the land to test you. To see if you will listen to the voice of the Lord and obey His commands. He uses that same word. It's uh, also used with Gideon, with the fleece. And that was a test. It uses that same word. And, uh, and one of the great places I well, looked this up, do you remember when David came to Saul and said, I'm willing to challenge Goliath. I, I, it just, I can't stand this uncircumcised Philistine challenging the, the armies of the host of Israel. So Saul says, well, you're crazy, but okay. What's the first thing Saul does? Tries to put his armor on David, remember? And, and David has this great response. He girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. He had not taken this armor to battle. He, this, and, and I thought, what a great use of this word again, and how important testing is. You know, have you ever noticed that scriptures consistently saying, be happy when you're tested. Be thankful when you have tribulation. And I'm going, why? This is why. It reveals what's actually there. If there's something that needs to change, it brings it to the open where we can bring it to the Lord and have it change. But this concept of testing, and then another place it's used, which you'll be very familiar with, is when the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon. And you know what, remember what it says? She came to test Solomon with questions. And she was going to find out, is he really the man I'm hearing he is? And after she questioned him, she said, you're so much greater than what I had been told. So the testing has many different meanings, but in, in a very real sense, it's to reveal the truth. And so in some sense, God was revealing something with Abraham, and because we have this as scripture, he was revealing something to us in this story. Um, I, it still bothers me that God asked him to offer up his son. It, it will never stop bothering me. God is God, and I'm glad I'm not God. But it, it is interesting, when we look at Scripture, and this is maybe one way to agree with Rabbi Sachs, that God was showing him that Isaac wasn't his. Because remember what David said when he went to buy, when he went to, uh, buy the threshing floor of Arana, which is this rock? It's that same place. Remember what Arana was going to do? He was going to give it to him. He was going to give it to him, and he was going to provide the, the offerings, and he was going to provide the wood. What did David say? I will not offer to the Lord that which what? Which costs me nothing. In other words, if it's not mine, if I haven't paid for it, I'm not making an offering of it. In some sense, I think God is really telling Abraham here, Isaac isn't yours, he's mine. 
And I think every parent has to go through that. I mean, it's very much, you know, we talk about consecration a lot in the house of Aaron, we're called to. And it's this getting straight on ownership and stewardship. Because you certainly do not own your children. You're responsible for them, but you're not, you don't own. Gerald, I think you had that up, Teresa. There was an article this morning, uh, sometime last week, somebody put it out an estimate of it costs $300,000 to raise a child. Uh, and, and the response that I read this morning was, you, you can't think of children as a cost center in business terms. So you have to think in terms of an investment. And one of the things he pointed out was there are a lot of people because of the pandemic and climate change and all these other you know, future threats. They said, I don't want to bring children into this world. And what the guy was pointing out was, he said, he said, you can't think of them that way because the child you bring into the world doesn't know what his conditions are going to be anyway, but they might be the one who provides the answer. And if you didn't have that child, you deprived people of that answer. So you, you just gotta quit thinking about your children as being a cost. That's a, I really love that uh, because I've seen this a lot. I've seen a lot of people saying, when I look at the mess of the world, I choose not to bring children into it. And I love that picture. They're not a cost center, they're an investment. And what's more, like you brought out, they are the answer to our future problems. And to prevent their being born is being Herod and Pharaoh. Teresa, you had your hand up. Yeah, I first was thinking, you know, when you said you just couldn't imagine <clears throat> sacrificing one of your kids. I mean, think about the moral and ethical stance that is and how that's come down. I mean, I think it's why believers, you don't like abortion. I mean, that viewpoint and that story. So, I mean, I teach history and try to tell people why are the stories of history important. You see a power in that story because if that happened to your family, you'd remember it. They did. Oh, you would and never how forget. It stands out in the midst of that culture where they had such a different view. Where, I mean, for many years, it's archaeologically true. They did. They offered their kids. They oh. They drove them and burned them in, you know, when things were bad for their city. You literally offered up their children. And so, I mean, it stands in such stark contrast to that. It's come down to us. I think it's really going to. That, that's an excellent point that the story does communicate the value of the child and that it belongs to God. But like you said, Teresa, I, I get Biblical Archaeology Review, and one of the things they find in a lot of the pagan altars, the bones of little children. They were offered as sacrifices. And in the Bible, you'll see a couple times where they did this, and it said it brought great spiritual uh, wrath, whatever you want to call it. But as I want to remind you of something else. One of the most famous passages in Scripture is Micah 6. Most of you know what Micah 6 is. He showed you what? He showed you, O oh man, what is good, what does the Lord require of you, but to do what? I think to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And that's, every translation is a little different. Do you know what's right before that? Micah says, what shall I bring to the Lord? Shall I bring him my firstborn? And of course the answer is, no. I don't want your firstborn. And yet, who does the firstborn belong to? The firstborn is always God's. In fact, when you look at scripture, it starts right off with the uh, battle between Cain and Abel is, is kind of over. Abel brought the first fruits and Cain didn't. And then we see the battle between Isaac and Ishmael, Esau and Jacob. Uh, the first city they took in the land was Jericho. What happened when Achan took some of that back? This concept of the firstborn is a powerful thing. And it goes all through scripture. Uh, we already mentioned this, but I think it's worth emphasizing again what Teresa brought out. That in Genesis 15, the word of the Lord comes to Abram in a vision. It says, do not fear. I am a shield. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram's response is, oh Lord God, what will you give me since I'm childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram, and Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. In other words, my servant. And it, this betrays, this is something that tells us the condition of Abram's heart. Genesis 22, God does test this to see where Abram is in his walk of faith. 
because Isaac belongs to God, not to Abraham. It, it, it remains a difficult story. And something else I think we all know when you uh, look at Scripture is that following the Lord is never a 50% commitment. And sometimes people say well, that's too hard, but you know, we expect this in so many ways. You know, if, if, you're, a pep, if you're a salesman for Pepsi and you start selling Coke on the side, you're going to get fired. Why you drink either of them is beyond me. But, <laughs> but seriously, that, you, you know that. And, and we all know too that when you have a couple get up and make, say, wedding vows to each other, no one has ever said, I promise to be faithful 95% of the time. And yet for some reason we think, well, I can serve God 95% of the time. And God is very often portrayed in Scripture as a husband, and very often a jealous one. And when you look at, Yeshua is even harder on this in a lot of ways than this story. Uh, in Luke 14, 33, I'll bet everyone here can quote it. So likewise, any one of you who desires to be my disciple must what? Forsake all that he has and come and follow me. He didn't say 99%, 99.9. He says, you forsake it all. And then he talks about the kingdom of God and he compares it to a treasure in a field. And what does the man do that wants the kingdom? He sells everything he has and gets the treasure. Then he compares it to a pearl. Same. I mean, how many stories did Yeshua tell where he said, there's nothing better than getting the kingdom, but it's going to cost everything. And in a certain sense, we see this with Abraham and Isaac. That God is saying, this is your whole world. It must be mine. It can't, you have to let go of everything. And something else I thought of as I was pondering this this week, because it, it, it troubled me. Uh, it always does, this, this whole story. But there's a mystery in the gospel that's okay. You can't understand everything. In fact, when Yeshua said you must become like someone, he didn't say you must become like a wise old philosopher who's got it all figured out. He says you must become like a little child. Children know there are mysteries, and they're okay with it. First Corinthians 6, Paul says something too. He says, don't you know that your body is a temple for the Ruach HaKodesh? This is the complete Jewish Bible. Who lives inside you, whom you receive from God. The fact is, you don't belong to yourselves. For you were bought at a price. So use your bodies to glorify. There, there are a lot of messages in this. And one of the ones that continues, I, I don't know why I had never thought of it. The whole description of this incident in Judaism is the Akedah, or Akedah. It, it is the binding. Why are we binding an, a sacrifice? There's something there that's just really quite different. And maybe it's like Margot says, it's to keep him still. I don't know. I, I think we all have to recognize Isaac was old enough that he had to be going along with this. He didn't know because he said, where is the sacrifice? But and Abraham, Abraham, Abraham says, God will see. He sees the sacrifice. Gerald. Yeah, I was thinking about this in the, in the continuum what God is doing because we see how Abraham's faith is increased and developed and, but I see Isaac learning from this event Isaac's life is not described in much detail in scripture but I see this as kind of fundamental to his belief in what God was doing through the rest of his life because you see Isaac take over the promise that was given to Abraham Abraham goes off marries Keturah you know he has a the rest of his life, but he's not the important person in the story after Isaac matures and, and, and becomes the inheritance. Yeah, no, Isaac, I mean, it is definitely a very important stepping stone for Isaac, too. And, and I was thinking about this in the comparisons with Yeshua. And one of the things that 
Christians, I think, get in trouble with. Greg was talking today about how believers can disagree and, and have tremendous disparity over differences in doctrine. And part of the problem, I think, is trying to solve mysteries. And, and, and I don't know that it's a problem to solve mysteries. I think it's a problem when I solve it and say, if you don't see it my way, then you've missed it. But so I don't, I don't pretend to say we're going to understand the offering of Isaac, though it's clearly a picture of the Messiah. But there are a lot of things in the Messiah's offering that people don't think about. Because when you think about it, we think of Yeshua as an offering, it's scriptural. But he was no way offered like a typical offering. He wasn't laid down on an altar and his throat cut. And yet it talks about his blood being taken in the most holy place in the heavens. And the only blood shed in the crucifixion that I know of is the spear in his side. But one of the things we do know is that I'll read from John 10. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life on behalf of the sheep. Do you have any idea how many times Yeshua told his disciples he was going to lay his life down for them? Were they expecting it? Not in the least. I mean, it scares me to death because I think, have you told me something a thousand times and I still didn't hear it? I lay down my life on behalf of the sheep. I also have other sheep which are not from this pen. I prefer the King James fold. It just sounds better. <laughs> I need to bring them and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it away from me. On the contrary, I lay it down of my own free will. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This is what my Father commanded me to do. Something I've thought of as we come to conclusion here, I, I do believe every story, and I know some commentators don't believe this. Maybe I shouldn't say every story. Maybe I should say most stories. But most stories apply to us as well as they do. And I wondered how many of us have promises, dreams that God has given us. We literally heard the voice of the Lord. And now when God starts to fulfill that, He says, I want it back. And sometimes people can't let go. But if it's from Him, He'll see it through to its completion. But it seems to be the most impossible test, I shouldn't say impossible, but nearly impossible test of faith. To know this is from God, He promised it, now I'm seeing it come to pass, and he says, let go. In a certain sense, your vision must die so that mine can live. It's just something to think about. 1 John 3.16 says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So in this story of Isaac... In, Symbolically, at least, his life being given up so that he can be the founder of Israel. I mean, you think about it. Isaac is the... It, scripture goes to great lengths. It's through Isaac that the seed will be reckoned. But he has to go through this transformational process, as Gerald brought out. What does that mean for us? Yeshua said something in John 12 as we close. There's a writing called the, the Law of Atonement, I believe is the name of the writing. And it says, where there is no death, there is no life. The world we live in, there is no life without death. That's a hard concept for how I'd like things to be. Yeshua said it this way, a seed until it dies remains alone. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
There's a lot in this story. It's an extremely important story. It's a story of coming to a place of hearing the voice of God and being able to do that even when it seems to oppose everything in us. And yet never losing confidence that God has your best interests at heart. And I, I still think, I don't know if there's a greater test that's depicted in Scripture than this story of Abraham with Isaac. But I'm not sure that any of us in some way don't share the same fate. Let's all stand. Brother Doug, would you close for us, please? Our Father, no, we're so grateful we come and be able to hear, understand, study the Scripture, and lighten our minds, Lord, about the various activities in the Bible, in the Bible and to show us, Lord, the truths that will affect our lives also. We're quite grateful, Lord, for the time we've come together in the worship. And we just want to praise you, Lord. You're worthy of all our praise. And May you continue to be with us through this day. Help us keep the Sabbath day holy. And help us, Lord, to realize that you are in control. And we trust you in all things. And we give our lives to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.